You've all heard of the joy of creation. Hell, it's probably one of the main reasons you clicked on this very video. It's arguably the most popular FNAF fan game of all time, boasting real-time 3D and insanely cool graphics. Yeah, <laughs> I've never played it. Okay, in my defense, only up until a month ago did I even own a good enough PC to properly run the game, and trust me, I definitely want to play it at some point. That's kind of what this video is about, actually. You see, before the creator of The Joy of Creation, Nixon, created the final story mode version of said game, he was working on another FNAF fan game project. This project was called Those Nights at Fredbear's, which ended up getting cancelled before it could be released. When the game was cancelled, Nixon decided to throw together the very first version of The Joy of Creation. However, this version of the game is probably not the one you're familiar with. That version would come a bit later, with The Joy of Creation story mode. However, there's a game that came out in between that very first version of The Joy of Creation and Story Mode, that being the subject of today's video, Those Nights at Rachel's. So just know, when I reference The Joy of Creation in this video and title, I'm referring to Story Mode, aka the version most people are familiar with, and what is the most popular version of that game. Whew, that was a mouthful. Anyway, unlike Fredbear's, this game actually did come out in a fully working state, boasting five full nights and even a hard mode. It's safe to say I was interested. Obviously, I want to play The Joy of Creation, but I think it's only fitting that I take a look at Rachel's first to see the beginning of Nixon's FNAF fan game career. This game has honestly been somewhat forgotten over the years. Sure, there are videos on this game with millions and millions of views, but even with that, I feel like discussion of this game is pretty rare nowadays. On the other hand, The Joy of Creation is still popular to this day, so if Nixon was able to create a game that was that successful and memorable, Surely Rachel's is also a high quality product. For the time it came out, it was honestly rare to see a full 3D FNAF fan game. And in the visuals department, this game still holds up really well. I'll get into that later. But for now, just know that this game, by all means, has not aged poorly or something. Regardless of the discussion around this game slowing down a lot over the years. In order for me to fully appreciate the joy of creation, whenever I get around to playing it, I feel like playing this game will give me an understanding of where Nixon started, and how much he has probably improved over the years. I only say probably because, well, I haven't played the damn game yet. But let's not kid ourselves here. I haven't even played The Joy of Creation yet, and I can tell it's a damn high-quality game. But enough stalling. Strap in, everybody. Today, we're gonna look at the game Nixon created before his massive success. A game that broke new boundaries for FNAF as a whole, and a game that was potentially the best FNAF fan game ever made when it came out. This is Those Nights at Rachel's. But first... Guys, I gotta tell you something. Your private login information for all sorts of websites could be out there on the internet right now. I know, crazy, right? You think you're safe until BAM it happens out of nowhere. Well, thanks to today's sponsor Aura, you can be secure on that front and a whole lot more. Here's how it works. Aura continuously monitors the dark web, looking for your emails, passwords, and social security numbers, and sends alerts straight to your phone when they find anything suspicious. Aura also gives you near real-time alerts on suspicious credit activity, like if someone was trying to open a loan or credit card in your name. They automatically send requests on your behalf to data brokers to remove your information, helping to reduce the amount of spam or robocalls you receive. Aura even comes with both an antivirus and a VPN, keeping you safe on all fronts of the internet. Identity theft is so common that there's a new victim every 14 seconds, and it costs the average victim over $1,000. So, what are you waiting for? Protect your family and yourself from identity theft at aura.com slash uh yeah by using the link in the description. Using my link will give you a two-week free trial so you really have nothing to lose. Thank you once again to Aura for sponsoring the video. Alright, I think the most interesting thing about this game that's super apparent right away is just how goddamn cool it looks. Up until this point, Every FNAF fan game I've covered, minus Five Nights at Sonic's, has been made in Click Team Fusion, which is the program that Scott Cawthon's FNAF games were made in. That program can only deal with 2D images, no actual real-time 3D stuff. That's why offices and FNAF games use that weird cylinder effect thing to add some depth to them, and the jump scares are just a series of pre-rendered images strung together. You can do some really cool stuff with this program, and I do tend to enjoy games made in Click Team way more than those made in other programs. Something about it really just helps sell that FNAF feel. Super random tangent, 
but the Popco's Evergreen Office tour they just recently showed off really proves how much you can do with Click Team nowadays. It really looks incredible. Also, please go buy Popco's Arcade on Steam right now, hashtag not sponsored. Anyway, I bring this all up because Those Nights at Rachel's is a real-time 3D game and was created using the Unreal Engine. The movement of your character around the office flows very well because of this, and it adds another layer of immersion that is sometimes lost with Click Team games. The office is actually quite complex, which is a little odd at first and is definitely overwhelming, but it very quickly begins to make sense and becomes super fun to traverse. You have multiple different parts of the room that you can either run to or turn around to. You have a desk, the doors, the camera, and finally the curtain. The desk features a monitor on top of it that shows how much power you have left during the night and which of the two doors is currently closed. Only one door can be closed at a time, so it's nice having something that just straight up quickly shows you which door is closed, even without actually looking at them. The main purpose of the desk, however, is the fact that you can actually hide under it. This is by far the safest place in the entire game, while also being the most dangerous. When you're under the desk, it acts as if both of your doors were closed. None of the main four animatronics can enter your room when you're under the desk. However, when you're under the desk, you still have to worry about the two other animatronics who are not fooled by you hiding, on top of the fact that if an animatronic is at the door when you leave the desk, you're pretty much good as dead. If you're using the desk to repel an animatronic at the door, you have to wait until you hear footsteps. That's when you know it's safe to finally leave. The gamble that the desk introduces really adds a lot to the gameplay, and you'll often find yourself in situations where the desk is the only option. If you're getting tag team from both doors, you have to hide under the desk, since it's the only way to get rid of two animatronics at once. Small details such as you getting up from under the desk, having a bit of wobble animation afterwards, adds a lot, and is another huge benefit of the game being real-time 3D. Small things like that really add to the immersion. Next up is the camera. This is pretty self-explanatory. You use the spacebar to bring up the camera, and you can view the entire building. The cameras do some really cool stuff with the fact that the game is in real-time 3D, such as seeing a flashing arcade in the background of one camera, and then having another camera be in that same arcade. Just little things like that make the building layout feel super realistic and connected, in a way that actually makes sense. The animatronics still just slowly move between cameras in the same way they do in FNAF 1, so there's not much real-time movement in that regard, but I think the FNAF 1 style of movement still works really well here, so no complaints from me. Small things such as the animatronics reacting to the lighting of the rooms in real time is super cool though. And I know that sounds hilarious, but obviously most FNAF fan games don't have any sort of real time lighting. So let me be happy about something, goddammit. If I had to give my critique regarding the map, I think the final camera before the right door is a little too far away from the actual office. It did confuse me a couple times, and I think if it was positioned a little bit closer like the left hallway, it would be a lot more obvious. But that's really just a small complaint, to be honest. The cameras are solid all around. This is the only place in the game where you can see the time, which makes sense. I've always liked it when FNAF fan games have the time be attached to an actual thing in the environment, such as the digital clock from Five Nights at Candy's. There's one final thing you can do with the camera station. If you press E on the keyboard, you're able to lean up a bit and see the left door. This then ties into the next section of the office being the right door area. This is simply just a wall where you can see the right door, but you can also kind of see the left door on the side of the room here as well which is just a cool byproduct of the office being an actual 3D space. You have a real-time flashlight as well you can shine in the doorways, which is just so cool. It adds so much to the gameplay, seeing the light actually interact with the darkness or the animatronics in a natural way. It's extremely satisfying to use. Finally, we have the curtain area. This is by far the most interesting area in the entire office, since you have to run over to it and leave your workstation in order to deal with it. It has heavy FNAF 4 vibes from a gameplay perspective, and you all know that I love FNAF 4. I've said it a thousand times at this point. The point of this area is to keep a curtain closed that is hiding a tall present box. This present box is home to an animatronic called The Thing, who is a really twisted and creepy version of the puppet. I'll get into them more later when I cover all the designs, but just know for now that I really love how this thing looks. It truly feels like you're trying to hold back a beast from escaping. If you ignore the curtain for too long and let The Thing escape, he'll jump scare you regardless of your position on the map. Yes, this even includes under the desk. This makes every trip over to the curtain the most stressful shit ever. The sting that plays when you're over there really adds to it as well. Every time you go to the curtain, you are pretty much risking your entire run if you haven't dealt with everything properly. And I absolutely love that kind of mechanic in FNAF games. That's why I adore the bedroom in Taiken Sun so much. It acts as both a safe area, but also an entire run killer. If you aren't 100% positive you've dealt with everything. As long as you're playing well, it shouldn't be an issue, but it always keeps you in check, which is why I love it so much. This idea is really just an evolution of the music box concept, 
but it works so much better in this format when it's something you actually have to run over and physically deal with. Now it's time to talk about the actual gameplay mechanics of the animatronics. This is where I find a lot of the issues start to creep in that confused me more than anything. The way this game's form and animatronics are set up is very similar to how Bonnie and Chico work in FNAF 1. Two of them only come to the left door, and two of them only come to the right door. However, one character from each door is slightly more aggressive than the other. For example, I literally did not see Rachel at my door once during my entire game. The titular character is that non-aggressive. However, Doug the dog, the other character who comes to the left door, was constantly there. This issue wasn't as bad with the right door, but I'm fairly certain that Pete the pig is much more aggressive than Bane the bull. If one character is going to be much more overstated than the others, what's even the point of having two characters per door, who do the exact same thing? It really just feels like character bloat for the sake of having more characters and confusing the player. I was super confused at first, since with four main animatronics after you, you'd think each one would have some sort of main difference. But it really just boils down to having two FNAF 1 Bonnies and two FNAF 1 Chicas. Maybe if you had to hide under the desk to deal with one character, and close the door to deal with another, it could be cool? You could have some in-game reason for it, such as Bane can break down the door with his head, so you have to hide under the desk and he's too dumb to see you down there. Just a small gameplay change such as that would make having four animatronics be a whole lot more worthwhile. Obviously my idea isn't a perfect fix, I'm no game designer, but I thought I'd throw it out there. Next up we have Ray the Raccoon. He's pretty much just the foxy of the game, however he is extremely easy to camera stall, and never once even tried running at the door during my playthrough. Which is such a shame, because him running through the cameras in real time 3D to get to the office is such a cool touch, that takes the idea of foxy running down the hall to the next level. I should probably talk about the jump scares now because for the most part, they are very good and got me multiple times. Most of them are animated very well, although it's kind of hard to tell what's going on for some of them. Knowing how good these jump scares are, mixed with the overall tension of the gameplay, leads to it being super scary. That added layer of immersion that the real-time 3D elements add really freaks me out in a lot of ways that most other FNAF fan games just haven't before. This literally only makes me more excited to finally play The Joy of Creation, because I can only imagine it takes all these concepts and refines them in even scarier ways. But wait, hold on a second. You all probably know the iconic punch jump scare that Ignited Bonnie has in The Joy of Creation story mode. I haven't even played the damn game and I know about it. It's that iconic. Well, take a look at Doug the dog's jump scare for a second. There's that iconic punch. It's super cool seeing elements from this game creep their way into the joy of creation. That pretty much covers it all for the gameplay. However, there's something I've been keeping secret from you all. While yes, I really do love this gameplay loop, I was actually making a huge mistake while playing the game. You see, when you hop into the game on night one, a million different controls are just thrown at you in the absolute worst way possible. It's super overwhelming, and it's an awful intro to the gameplay that ended up confusing me for multiple nights of it. Some of the most important aspects of the game are leaning over the camera to see the left door and using the flashlight. Well, since so much is thrown at you at the start, I ended up forgetting the lean and the flashlight even existed, which makes the game way harder than it actually is. For four nights straight, I was playing the game completely wrong, and truly thought it was just designed poorly. I feel really stupid about this, but the way the controls are just thrown at you sucks, and I'm probably not the first person to forget about stuff like this. Thankfully, Night 5 is a great challenge, and since I understood how to actually play the game at that point, I was able to fully enjoy the gameplay loop. Sadly, there isn't a Night 6 or anything beyond Night 5, which leads me to believe this game is somewhat unfinished, even in its released state. Not even having a custom night feels weird to me, as that would probably be a very simple inclusion. Please, just let me fucking beat it! Let's go! Come on! No. Oh. We did it. We did it, Reddit. We did it, Reddit! Let's go! Woo! Okay, I got this down pack. I got this down pack. I get it. What the fuck?! Did I die? Did I- Did I die? <laughs> However, there's something else this game offers if you want an extra challenge. There's a separate EXE file on the Game Jolt page that lets you play the hard mode of Those Nights at Rachel's. Hard mode changes the designs of the animatronics, changes the look of the office and the cameras, and of course, makes the game much harder. I played around in it for a bit, and yeah, it's a really good challenge. I haven't fully beaten it yet, of course, but maybe at some point it'd be fun to stream. The jump scares in it are even better, 
thanks to the designs being much creepier. So let me know if you'd be interested in seeing me play it live. Before we wrap up here, I think it's super important to talk about the designs of the animatronics. This was one of the main factors that made me interested in playing this game. Since Rachel's design, while pretty much just being a simple Bonnie recolor with slight changes, really works in my opinion. The grey coloration mixed with the purple highlights stands out super well, and I would kill for a Rachel version of that Bonnie Hex plush. It would be a super simple recolor, and I would absolutely buy it. Will it happen? Definitely not. Like I said earlier, those nights at Rachel's is pretty irrelevant nowadays, and even though the joy of creation is part of the fanverse, this game isn't. Which I totally get, but I also totally wish it was, because I would love to see an updated or refined version of this game someday alongside official merch of the characters. Outside of Pop Goes and Candies, we really don't have that much OC content in the fanverse anymore, so I would totally kill to see this series included in some way. But I get it if Nixon wants to just move on from this game. Not a big deal. Anyway, that was a bit of a tangent, but all I'm trying to say is that even though this design is super simple, it totally kicks ass, and I really love this character. I wish she was just in her own game more, though. Next up is Doug the Dog, who is a really good animatronic dog design. The yellow highlights stand out quite well in the white and black color palette, and of course, you gotta love that punch jump scare animation. Super solid design all around. Bane the Bull and Pete the Pig is where my praise kind of ends, though. These designs look like they're from a completely different game, and I'm not a huge fan of them either. The weird bulbous eyebrow area muscles they have going on look really ugly. In fact, they're just ugly in general. This design trope kind of works okay on Bane, but Pete is just gross. Pig Patch is a much better pig animatronic design. Next up is Ray the Raccoon. He feels like an in-between of the Rachel and Doug design philosophy and the Pete and Bane design philosophy. He almost feels a little bit too over-designed. He's trying to do the whole foxy thing, but instead of a pirate, he's trying to be a cowboy. But while Foxy's pirate theming is kept to a minimum, it's very obvious here and I don't know how to feel about it. The withering on this design also doesn't feel very believable, to be honest. I'm not a huge fan. Ray isn't an awful design, but there are some very simple changes that would probably improve it a lot. Finally, we have The Thing. Thankfully, we are ending on a high note because oh man, does this dude's design rock. The glowing purple eyes mixed with the monstrous looking face really makes him stand out. I said it earlier, but this dude looks like a genuine monster, something to be feared, and something that you would actually want to keep in his box. The design being as good as it is really complements the gimmick he has in the gameplay. One final thing I'd like to mention is Shadow Rachel. Sometimes when you turn, Shadow Rachel will be on screen for like two seconds, and every time it happens, it got me. Shit. Uh, hello. What the fuck was Sorry that? about that. Holy Just shit. Accidentally picked up at the wrong moment. What? Uh, that pretty much covers the entire game, though. A sequel was planned at one point, but ended up getting scrapped and somewhat turned into an April Fool's game called Rachel's 2 Reloaded, where you shoot T-posing animatronics with a gun. It's pretty funny. But the game crashes on my computer for some reason, so I can't really give my thoughts on it. Not like it really matters anyway, just thought I'd bring it up. Those Nights at Rachel's is an experience I really enjoyed, and while we'll probably never see it appear again in any official capacity, it's still really cool being able to go back and play the predecessor to the joy of creation. Hopefully I'll cover those games someday, so I'm ready for whenever the Ignited Collection finally drops. Anyway, that's pretty much it, but uh... Hey Daco, if you're watching, uh... Please make me a one-of-a-kind Rachel Hex plush and send it to the address on screen right- <laughs> Nah, I'm just kidding, uh... Unless... Anyway, uh, I've been Oh uh, Yeah, and make sure to give this game a try using the link in the description or on the end card. See ya!